on this very special Easter morning, I want to welcome you to our time of worship. Normally, I would be standing before you in our church sanctuary, but today is far from normal for the first time since we first started meeting as a church back in the fall of 1998. No one is in the building on Easter Sunday. As you know, an aggressive virus is spreading, not just across our nation, but around our world. We've been instructed to stay isolated, to keep a distance from one another. So on this unusual Easter Sunday, instead of your coming to meet for worship with one another, we're worshiping alone to be safe. A similar situation occurred among Jesus' disciples way back in the first century. Instead of their being seen in public, they sought safety by staying isolated. Like some of you, but for a different reason, they were fearful. They were facing an uncertain future. Their master had been arrested, put through a series of unfair trials, declared guilty and nailed to a cross where he died. They didn't face an invisible enemy like we do. They didn't fear being infected by a virus, but because of their close association with Jesus, they feared being found by Jesus' enemies, arrested, ultimately suffering the same dreadful fate as he. Just like you and me, they had no idea how long they would need to prolong this existence or who might be next to die. Our minds can play tricks on us in unusual circumstances. Fear can make cowards of us all. It also has a way of dulling our memory. It's easy to forget specific promises or to find comfort in words like, don't be afraid, for I am with you. Don't be discouraged, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and I will help you. I will hold you up with my victorious right hand. We can have words like this blocked from our memory. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Why should I be afraid? The disciples didn't remember those promises. Easy for us to forget them as well. So it's easy to understand how the disciples could forget the promises their master had made, that he would suffer many terrible things. He would be killed, but on the third day, he would be raised from the dead. And again, he said, the Son of Man is going to be betrayed into the hands of his enemies. But on the third day, he will be raised from the dead. And he repeated that several other times. But in their fears and disillusionment, they failed to remember his reassuring words. Finally, the same evening, after he had been miraculously and bodily resurrected that morning, Jesus stood in the room where they were huddled together. The door was locked, but he came through that door. His first words to them, not surprising, Shalom, peace be to you. He didn't shame them because they forgot his promise. He didn't rebuke them for isolating themselves in fear from those who might hurt them, but he brought those struggling and very human disciples words of comfort and reassurance. He did something else. He showed them the scars in his hands and on his side. What a powerful proof of identity. No other living person bears the scars of crucifixion. When they saw those scars, the Apostle John tells us they were filled with joy. In the midst of their exuberance, he repeats his word, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I'm sending you. And that's exactly what he did. And when they took that challenge, why well, they turned the world upside down. Author Philip Yancey writes this, One need only read the Gospels' descriptions 
of disciples huddling behind locked doors and then proceed to the descriptions in the book of Acts as the same men proclaiming Christ openly in the streets and in jail cells to perceive the seismic significance of what took place on Easter Sunday. The resurrection is the epicenter of belief. It is not a belief that grew up within the church. It is the belief around which the church itself grew up and the given on which its faith is based. What a profound statement regarding the resurrection. That first Easter not only removed the fear from the hearts of those first 11 disciples, it changed a sniffling band of anxious and unreliable followers into fearless evangelists. That remarkable sequence of personal transformation offers the most convincing evidence for the resurrection. What else explains the whiplash change in men known for their cowardice and instability? My hope for you today is that the reminder of Jesus' resurrection will have a similar effect on your life, that your fears will be dissipated, that your anxieties will be calmed, that your focus will shift from the worry over the spread of an invisible enemy to the worship of one who conquered death by rising from the grave and is alive forevermore. May this Easter service change your entire perspective. And now let's enter into this great time of worship on this special Easter morning. For he is risen. He is risen indeed. Please take your hymnal with you and stand as we together acknowledge the victory our Savior won for us. He is risen. He is risen indeed. He is risen. He is risen indeed. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Please remain standing.
third congregational hymn in the morning, we're going to ask you to join the choir and orchestra in singing what has become perhaps the most beloved Christian song of all time. It was written 250 years ago by George Frederick Handel. I'm sure you've heard it often. It's the Hallelujah Chorus from the Oratorio Messiah. Interestingly, it's, it's in our hymnal. I did not know that, but, but I checked. It's hymn number 39. They have all the voice parts. So turn there and uh, now, if all you do is stand there and smile like a Cheshire cat, that's, that's okay, all right? If you wanna make up something on your own, that's okay too. The choir and the orchestra is gonna carry this, okay? So, so don't worry about making a mistake, but I think there's some lines in there that we're all familiar with and uh, you can join in singing with us. All right, we've got three measures of intro and then we're in.
I love it. That was great. Some of you didn't quite know what to do. I, <laughs> you were terrific. We're going to sign some of you up for this choir. That was marvelous. Loved it. Thank you. Maybe you didn't know what you were singing. <laughs> so let me interpret it for you. Hallelujah is from Hallel, which means to praise. And Yah is the representation of Yahweh or Lord. Praise the Lord. It is a statement of praising our God. And you did that beautifully, beautifully. We need to do that every year, Don. That is a magnificent idea. <laughs> Marvelous. Yeah, look at this. Now we change scenes. From the familiar to the unfamiliar, from the world we know about to a world quite likely you've never stepped into, nor had Paul. He was about to take on an opportunity he never dreamed would be his, but it was what we might call the sine qua non of a preacher's life. He had the opportunity in the city of all cities to declare the great news to a group of people who had never in their lives heard it before. What a privilege. It's recorded for us in the 17th chapter of Acts, an unusual text for a resurrection morning, but because Paul's message is a climax at that point, it seemed appropriate. And again, these people who were listening to him as he declared it, it was all new information. Never before had those words entered their ears, ever. And they're all very intelligent people. And here they were listening to a man they had never seen or known before telling them about a world they needed to know about. As you would expect, some turned it off. Some were curious and wanted to hang around and learn more. Others, at the moment they heard it, believed it. I want to read for you from Acts 17, 22 through 34. If you have your Bible with you, follow along. I'll be reading from the New Living Translation, beginning at the 22nd verse of the 14th of Act, of the 17th of Acts, and imagine yourself in Paul's place as he delivers his soul to these people. Let's stand together out of respect for the Word of God. Acts 17, 22. So Paul, standing before the, the council, addressed them as follows. Men of Athens, I noticed that you were very religious in every way. For as I was walking along, I saw your many shrines, and one of your altars had this inscription on it, to an unknown God. This God whom you worship without knowing is the one I'm telling you about. He is the God who made the world and everything in it. Since he is Lord of heaven and earth, he doesn't live in man-made temples, and human hands can't serve his needs, for he has no needs. He himself gives life and breath to everything, and he satisfies every need. From one man he created all the nations throughout the whole earth. He decided beforehand when they should rise and fall, and he determined their boundaries. His purpose was for the nations to seek after God and perhaps feel their way toward him and find him, though he is not far from any of us. 
For in him we live and move and exist. As some of your own poets have said, we are his offspring. And since this is true, we shouldn't think of God as an idol designed by craftsmen from gold or silver or stone. God overlooked people's ignorance about these things in earlier times, but now he commands everyone everywhere to repent of their sins and to turn to him. For he has set a day for judging the world with justice by the man he has appointed, and he proved to everyone who this is by raising him from the dead. When they heard Paul speak about the resurrection of the dead, some laughed in contempt, but others said, we want to hear more about this. That ended Paul's discussion with them, but some joined him and became believers. Among them were Dionysius, a member of the council, and a woman named Damaris, and others with them. Will you join me in prayer, please, as we bow together? How grateful we are, our Father, that we have been raised to hear the message of Christ since our earliest years. How thankful we are for faithful parents, even grandparents, who spoke of him as if their very best friend and introduced us to him that he might become for us the Savior, our guide and master. Our hearts go out today to the many who not only do not know him, but have never even heard of him. May we hear today and may there be a response of true faith and trust in the one who gave himself for us on that cross where we first saw the light. Thank you for the cross that brings us all at the same level at its foot. And thank you, Father, for the Savior who died that we might live and for the privilege of proclaiming him today because he lives, we shall live also. We give our gifts in his name and for his purpose. Through Christ our Savior we pray and we give. And every one of us said, Amen. Amen. Please be seated.
There's something enthralling about Paul in Athens. There's just something right about that, even though it may have seemed weird to those who live there, for he was, he was so out of place. Here is this ultra-conservative, raised an Orthodox Jew, born in a family in Tarsus, trained in Tarsus, then at Jerusalem, a Pharisee of the Pharisees, and then through the grace of God, converted to Christ. But all of his training and all of his thinking was focused clearly on the truth of the scriptures, start to finish. And of all things, here is, is this, this narrow, monotheistic Jew walking the streets of the most broad-minded liberal city in the Roman Empire. Rome had annexed it, but it was still bragging of its being the cradle of democracy and the place that thought for itself. No place like Athens. Sort of a Harvard and, 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 and Yale and Princeton and MIT and Stanford and uh, the Oxford and Cambridge and Caltech all wrapped up in one sophisticated scene. On top of that intelligentsia, there are these philosophers who strut their stuff all around the city as they uh, speak of things they don't understand, but they make it sound like it's your fault, which is the uh, definition of a good philosopher. Anyway, there they were declaring what they believed and often leading to a dead-end street. And here is Paul rubbing shoulders wall to wall with a forest of idols, a forest of idols. In fact, the way the Greek reads in this account, Athens lived under idols. It's the only time in all of Greek literature, including the New Testament, when that particular term is used for under idols. Quite like it had in mind the idea of being smothered with or submerged under idols swamped by idols. Listen to various contemporaries as well as those who lived later describing Athens. Hosanius writes, Athens had more images than all the rest of Greece. Pliny adds, in the time of Nero, Athens had 25 to 30,000 public statues excluding 30,000 just in the Parthenon. Let me explain. On the Acropolis, which is a big word for above the city, sat the magnificent architectural and artistic structure of the Parthenon, multi-column built by 435 BC in honor of Athenia, and there she stood in gold and ivory with a massive spear that reached so high above the roof, this open area roof of the Parthenon, that the, the point of her spear could be seen 40 miles in circumference. Massive, massive idol in honor of Athenia. And within this Parthenon, were 30,000 idols just there. Petronius sneered, it's easier to find a god than a man in Athens. A renowned archaeologist writes, one could stand on the agora, which is the Greek word for marketplace, one could stand on the marketplace and every place the eye turned. Think of it. Every place the eye turned, a prominent figure carved in wood, stone, or cast in precious metal could be seen, not including those in shrines, 
temples, and residential homes. One wag described Athens as a junkyard of idols, filled with idols. And here, the lone figure of Paul, walking in the midst of this forest of idols. He was about as out of place as a full-size statue of Martin Luther standing in the Vatican. I mean, here was Paul, this orthodox, thinking, converted Jewish Christian missionary whose whole frame of reference has been beyond the idols and above that world, now walking among them. And by the way, while we're thinking of of the scene, remember where you find idols of this number, you find the presence of demons. As a missionary friend of mine says who lives in the third world, when you're around a lot of idols, you can smell the demons. I'm sure Paul felt that way. In fact, in simple little outline to follow when you read Acts 17, 16 to 34, you read first about what Paul saw, which we've been spending time thinking about, and then next you read about what Paul felt. And then you read about what Paul did, and finally what Paul said. I love simple outlines, and that's about the best you can come up with. It's the John R. W. Stott outline of Acts chapter 17, 14 through uh, 16 through 34. What Paul saw and felt and did and said. How did he feel? Well, it's, it's not difficult to wonder about that because he tells immediately he was deeply troubled by all the idols he saw everywhere. We get our word paroxysm from the Greek word translated. He was deeply troubled. He was provoked. Frustrated. He could only imagine what life must be like in private, if this is the way life looks in public. There were the Stoics who believed we should press on fearlessly and proudly, accepting the laws of the universe, however harsh they may be, and never once showing emotion, remaining passive and disengaged. Those are the Stoics. On the other end of the spectrum were the Epicureans, they believed that happiness and pleasure was life's highest good, and both should be pursued with unbridled passion. In fact, there was no judgment. There is no beyond this life existence. So hey, their motto, which they made popular and it still lives today, was eat, drink, be merry, tomorrow we die. So there were the Epicureans and the Stoics and those others gathered around this man. He first goes to the synagogue, we read in verse 16 and 17. He reasons with the Jews and a few of the, of, of the Greeks who were there. And then uh, he spoke daily in, in the Agora, in the public square. I don't know, maybe sort of a free speech platform. Free speech platforms are interesting places. Anything can happen. I remember when I was finishing my years at Dallas Seminary and Sweet Anderson, a, a fellow student, said to me, let's go, to, let's go up to Oklahoma University and let, let's, uh, let, let's stand on a free, a free speech platform and let's, and, and let's just preach the gospel. Okay, Chuck, you ready for that? And I said, yep. 
let's go. So we go up there, and uh, he's experienced in it being with Crusade, Campus Crusade for several years, but this was the first for me. So I stood on one platform. He was about 12, 15 feet away, and, and we just preached our hearts out. He said, don't hold back. Don't worry about what they do or what they say. And all of a sudden, I get hit by a rotten tomato. And he gets hit by one. He looks over at me and says, ain't this fun? <laughs> Free speech platform. I don't know, maybe Paul was on a platform like that. Maybe he was standing up declaring the message. And here were these philosophers, far too sophisticated to throw tomatoes. But they were steer sneering at him like, what in the world is this guy trying to tell us? They are what I used to call when I was a kid, eggheads. They're all the, uh, see, you're getting toward the title. You wondered what my title was all about. The Areopagus eggheads versus a seed picker. Well, he's the seed picker. You see how they refer to him? Look down at verse, uh, verse 18. When he told them about Jesus and his resurrection, they said, What's this babbler trying to say to us? Interesting word. It means gutter snipe. It's the picture of a little bird that hops around picking up seeds and spreading them here and there, except when it's a person, you pick up thoughts here and there, and like a good plagiarist, you quote that somewhere else as if it's your statement. And they saw him as sort of a, a seed-picking plagiarist. I, I, if you can't imagine that, think of the little birds that hop around McDonald's parking lot, and you'll, you'll remember they're picking up little bits of, of uh, fries here and there, and they're, they're, the, they're the seed pickers of the area. That, that's where they saw Paul. Who is this seed picker on his free speech platform telling us about some J J Jesus, is it? And, and, and about, a, about a what? A resurrection? Remember all their lives, it's like you live and you die and you die like a dog. And here this man has the audacity to tell him about life after death. So, surprise of surprises, the philosophers move close to him and they say to him, come here. We want you to come with us and do your presentation at the highest court of the land. It's like a person who is visiting our United States and through an interesting chain of events, they wind up having an audience with the Supreme Court. This is the Supreme Court of Athens. It's called the Areopagus. Pagos means hill. Ares was the god of war among the Greeks. When Rome took over, it changed it to Mars Hill, but it was then known as Ares Hill or Areopagus. What's significant is that's where they met to make their high court decisions. This was the highest, most significant, and sophisticated place you can imagine. And Paul, <laughs> unknown to him when the day started, is now finding himself soon to be standing on the Areopagus. I don't know if Paul kept a, a, a journal or not, uh, but if it did, if he did, I think the journal this day began Simple words, uh, alone in Athens. But before the page is over, he's talking about standing on the Areopagus. I suppose every preacher has his dream spot where he would love someday to be able to stand and declare the truth. One of my experiences came several years ago when the Commandant of the United States Marine Corps, uh, General Krulak, got a hold of me and uh, I had never met him before and he said to me, uh, 
We'd love to have you come to the National Cathedral and preach to our graduates who are the officers graduating from Quantico, uh, where they have been in training. It'll be at the National Cathedral, and he said, I need to tell you, uh, there'll, there'll be a, a, a number of Marine Corps brass there. And, uh, that's the understatement of the day. When I got there, not only was stuck General Krulak there, but all these generals and colonels and, and all the moguls of the outfit dressed in white right down front. I mean, it would have intimidated an elephant. And there, there, they, there they sat staring at me, and here I am smiling back at them. And over here is the graduates of the uh, class of that year from Quantico. And by the way, I should mention that the Drum and Bugle Corps, just before I spoke, played Amazing Grace with bagpipe. Oh, I started to shout, glory, but I realized I was in a place where you don't do that. In fact, earlier, uh, General Krulak had said to me, oh, praise God, you're here to speak. May the, and he took me in his arms and he said, may the Spirit of God use you and bless you this day as you tell everyone here about Jesus Christ, our Savior. This is the commandant. I mean, it's hard to hug a man when you're standing at attention, and he's right there beside you. Well, what a privilege. And for the next 15 minutes, I had the, the, the uh, privilege to speak on the subject he gave me. It was integrity. Now, they gave Paul no subject. They just said, we want you to come up here and talk. Now, stop and think about this. When you read verses 22 through 31, his entire speech is in 10 verses. You can read it with pauses in two minutes. Don't get your hopes up. <laughs> and furthermore, he used terms. He used terms anyone could understand. Well, of course. They may be intelligent, but they're not clued into spiritual terms. So there is not one quotation from the Old Testament. Not one. They weren't familiar with Old Testament writings. If they were, it was in passing. Not one quote. However, there is a quote from Aratus, one of the Greek poets of Soli, who, who wrote his piece to Zeus in the third century BC, and Paul has enough presence of mind to weave all of that into his talk. Now, the reason I'm taking time for this is because he had no time to prepare. If you're not a preacher, you know, aside from the privilege of declaring the message, the most important part of your privilege is to prepare for it. And usually that takes uh, 10 to 20 times the amount of time it takes to deliver it. But he doesn't have that time. Their invitation comes at the Agora, and he winds up in a matter of a brief walk as he climbs the slick stones leading up to the Areopagus. He, he only has minutes. But this, of course, is what the man has prepared for, for a lifetime. He's ready. I want you to see the genius of his delivery. First of all, he started right where they were. Verse 22. Men of Athens, I notice that you are very religious in every way. Remember where he had been? Walking among the idols. He doesn't insult them. He, he doesn't poke fun at them. He simply states a fact. It's like if a person is visiting Texas for the first time and delivers a speech in Dallas, he may say to the audience, I'm standing today before Texans. I understand you are fiercely independent, proud people. And most of us would go, yeah, that's us. Well, that's the way they must have felt. Yep, we're a religious bunch. 
Paul acknowledges that. What a gracious way to start. And then he goes on. Please observe, he used the familiar to introduce the unfamiliar. As I was walking along, I saw your many shrines, and one of your altars had this inscription, Agnostotheo. I, I, I read the inscription right there on the bust of the altar of the statue. I would imagine this idol had no face. Agnosto, unknown, Theo, God. Whoever had crafted the altar or sculpted the idol had deliberately named it unknown. Perhaps the Greeks were troubled with the thought that of all their idols, they may have missed one. He may have been important, God, that they had overlooked. And so they built a statue to Agnostotheo, unknown God. Paul said, I noticed that. By the way, you know all those philosophers were familiar with that idol. You know they had stood before it, frowning, wondering who it was and what it represented. Now look at the transition. Fabulous. He says, this God, this, this un unknown God whom you worship without knowing is the one I'm here to tell you about. I'm going to put a face on that idol. I'm going to give him a name. I'm going to introduce you to him so that you will realize the one you have never known before. Again, it is not insulting. It is almost a magnetic genius idea of drawing them in. They're now curious. Who is this identity of Agnostotheo? Who could it be? So having used the unfamiliar, or the familiar, to introduce the unfamiliar, Paul now begins to introduce them to the God of heaven and earth. Look how he does it. First, he introduces him as the creator, 24. He's the God who made the world and everything in it. So you didn't just happen. You were made. You and I were created by this one you call the unknown God. And second, he's the originator. He's truly Curios, their word for Caesar. He's truly the Lord. How could he say it? Because he has not only made the world and everything in it, he is also Lord of heaven and earth. He doesn't live in man-made temples. And human hands cannot serve his needs for he has no needs. Not only is he creator, not only is he originator and Lord, he's sovereign. By now, you could have heard a tiny, tiny nail drop to the stone on the Areopagus. These philosophers are stroking their beards wondering, who is this? What's he talking about? If you ever have the privilege of sharing your faith in Christ to someone who has never heard, and they're patient enough, and you are careful enough to sustain a relationship in the dialogue, you will find at times their mouths will drop open. 
They're hearing what they've never heard before. They've been made by God. He's the one who originated them. He made not only heaven and earth, he made each one of them. He doesn't live in man-made temples, though every God they serve lives in a temple. In fact, he has no needs. In fact, he is the one who gives life and breath to everything. He's the one who satisfies needs. You may be intelligent. You may be brilliant beyond the scales of measurement, but you know what an empty, lonely night is like. And the apostle pr plays on that as he says to them, you have needs he can meet. He can satisfy your every need. Then he goes back to creation and begins with Adam. Without naming Adam, they would not have a clue. So he says, through one man, he created all the nations through the whole earth and decided beforehand when they would rise and when they would fall. Sounds to me like a God who is in control. He's the, he's the source of life. Look at this. His purpose, verse 27 continues, was for the, for the nations to seek after him and perhaps feel their way toward him and find him, though he isn't far from us. Maybe he sensed his audience is beginning to drift. Maybe he knew this was the perfect time to insert that illustration. So he does it. And this is all done without preparation. Paul in his studies knows of the writing of Aratus of Soli, and he quotes him here, fits him right into his message. As some of your own poets have said, we are his offspring. If you read the whole poem, you will see that it revolves not around the living God, but Zeus, the top God of the people of Greece. Listen to it. Here is what Aratus wrote. For we are his offspring. The poem goes as follows. Zeus fills the streets and marts. Zeus fills the seas and the shrines or the shores and the rivers. Everywhere our need is Zeus. We also are his offspring. Genius! Paul picked up the last line of that poem and inserts it right here. As one of your own poets has said, we are his offspring. But it isn't Zeus. It is the God who has created us. It is the God you've never met. But the God who is accessible since we live and exist because of him. And now he drives it home. God overlooked people's ignorance about these things in earlier times, but now he commands everyone everywhere to repent of, whoa, whoa, wait, wait, wait. There's a word they've not heard. You can be sure in all the philosophical literature there's nothing written of repentance and certainly nothing written of personal sins. Paul weaves them together and says everyone everywhere is to repent of their sins. I have to pause here and, and say something regarding his courage. It took courage to say this. Knowing that he was all alone, not only a sing singular figure on the streets of Athens, but standing alone among these eggheads as they are sizing him up and coming to terms with what he says, and he has the temerity to say, this is a God who holds us accountable. It is appointed unto us once to die, and after this, the judgment. What a moment. But that's not the end. He adds, for he has set a day for judging the world with justice by the man he has appointed, and he proved to everyone who this is by raising him from the dead. 
end of message. That's as far as they could take it. At that point, the laughter began to break out. They began to answer back. What they said were not told. But we are told that they laughed at him in contempt. By the way, when you look at the ending of this chapter, you'll see three common responses to every presentation of the gospel, including mine today. First, there is what we might call the cynical response. There are those who laugh at it. Are you kidding me? I mean, one man dies on a cross for the sins of the whole world? Where do I go to crack up? That is not only stupid, that's silly. So they're laughing at him and, the, and, and, and uh, Paul standing there taking it. Then there's the second response. There were those far more charitable who said, Hmm, we want to hear more about this later. I call these the curious. And there are some of you here in that category today. You're not ready to make a decision, but you want to know more, which is why a church exists, to provide answers for those who seek them. And why we Christians are in the streets, of our towns and cities. We are here to help people know there are answers and their curiosity can be satisfied. Paul is not given an opportunity to follow up. In fact, we know nothing of what happens to this group. At the end of this talk, you see in chapter 18, verse 1, then Paul left Athens. He never returns. There is no follow-up. So I wonder, as I read this, if these who are curious choose to follow along. And they go with him down from the Areopagus back to the Agora and spend time at the speech platform listening further to him as he talks of this faith in Christ. But as is always true, or I would say often true, the third category, there are some who at that moment joined him and became believers, like some of you today. Some of you today realize, well, it hasn't been Athens and it hasn't been a literal statue to an unknown God. You've served all your life an emptiness that has brought no eternal satisfaction. No peace at night when your head falls into the pillow. No relief from the haunting guilt that follows you after the wrong you do and the failures of your life. You know nothing of his forgiveness, his grace, his mercy, and the joy of walking with him and knowing a life of abundance in Christ. These people heard enough to believe. In fact, one is named. One left the ranks of the philosophers at Areopagus. Look at him, Dionysius, a member of the Areopagus, a member of the council. Along with him, there's a woman there named Damaris. We know nothing more. But they at that moment turned their lives over to Christ. Paul had no way of knowing that this talk he gave would ever be remembered. I'm uh, currently reading again the book on uh, uh, Abraham Lincoln and a team of rivals. And it's fascinating to read Lincoln's own feelings about the Gettysburg Address. Uh, he, he was convinced it was a little piece never to be remembered in the years ahead, how wrong he was. And for Paul, 
in, in, in utter humility and being lost in, in his world at that time, I, I'm convinced he never thought further, someday my words will be remembered and down through the centuries they'll refer back. I, I think Paul never, never dreamed of it. But you know what? They're now in the book of God. They're now in the Bible. His little two-minute talk this, this brief, albeit magnificent, message has been retained, preserved, word for word, for us down through the centuries to find encouragement from. But there's more. While reading John Pollock, the British biographer of the life of Paul, I came across an interesting insight I'd never seen before. It made me uh, pause and remember. I too have visited the Parthenon as my wife and I and a small group of our friends took a tour there and, and we, we've stood there and I've seen the flag of the nation of Greece fly alongside the Parthenon as it waves in the breeze. John Pollock points out in his biography of Paul that every Good Friday, that flag is lowered to half-mast in honor of this message that Paul gave to the Athenians. Amazing. But what is equally interesting is that on Easter Sunday morning, whoosh, the flag goes to the top of the mast as people gather not only from the city of Athens, but many tourists on that site on Easter morning to shout their statement of praise to God regarding their Savior. Isn't that magnificent? Before we do that together, I have to say to you, who've heard this and not yet responded. There's no magic in this moment. Just because on Easter Sunday you chose to spend your time with us, for which we are grateful, there's no change that will automatically come over you because you've heard a story. The change will come when you lower your knees before the living God, just as the flag is lowered to half-mast in honor of our Savior's death, and then as you give your heart to the Lord Jesus Christ, trusting in Him and Him alone as your own personal Savior. I would be derelict in my responsibilities if I left with only a shout of triumph, knowing that for some of you, You've yet to make this decision. Make this decision. I plead with you, don't put it off. Oh, there's more information that could be shared, but you've heard enough to know this one died for you. He can be your Savior, your Master, your Lord, and it can begin today. On this day, when we stand together and make our announcement once again, He is risen. 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 Thank you, each one of you, for spending this time on Easter Sunday morning with us. We had the privilege of being bystanders as we observed Paul, the Jewish missionary from Tarsus, standing all alone before the all-Gentile and very sophisticated group of philosophers whom we might call the Supreme Court of Athens. Let's return to the three responses as soon as he had finished talking. First, there was the cynical response, those who laughed in contempt. Second, there were the curious. They sort of shrugged their shoulders. They wanted to hear more later on, but, but not now. 
Third, there were the committed. Some joined him, we read, and they became believers. Three responses, mockery, delay, belief. Those who mocked and those who put him off didn't concern themselves with whether Paul's message was true or not. To both of those groups, it seemed simply trivial, not worth their time right now. I find it worth noting that Paul neither begged nor pleaded. He let it be. It's that third category that intrigues me. One was actually a member of that sophisticated court of philosophers. His name was Dionysius. Another was an otherwise unknown woman named Damaris. We're told there were, quote, others with them. We don't know how many, and we actually know nothing more of any of them later on as the scriptures were being written. Since that's true, there's no reason to spend our time trying to speculate and concern ourselves with them. A greater concern I have is with you. Especially you who turn away with no further concern about life eternal or the person of Jesus Christ. We would love to connect with you personally. We'd love to help you understand what a significant difference the Savior can make in your life. But I'll not beg or plead. I'll just say, if you reach out to us, we'll reach back to you. We're here, we care, and we're available. Now, to you who are in that committed category, the truly committed to following the Lord Jesus, let us help you get started and stay strong. Believe it or not, the Lord wants you deeply involved. He wants to use you to deepen your faith, to strengthen and expand your knowledge of him. He wants to use you to touch the lives of others who don't know him. We'd love to help you get in your own study of the scriptures. Learn more about prayer, about grace, about God's love, and sharing your faith. You've been left here to bring stability to a fractured, broken world. I like the way another person wrote about this. Jesus left few traces of himself on earth. He wrote no books or even pamphlets. A wanderer, he left no home or even belongings that could be enshrined in a museum. He did not marry, settle down, and begin a dynasty. We would, in fact, know nothing about him except for the traces he left in human beings. That was his design. Since that was his design, how comforting it is to those who struggle to know there is someone like Christ who is left on this earth to bring what he modeled, like reliable stability. When Christ departed, he left people just like us to bring his message of hope and comfort, strength and stability. Like I said earlier, ours is a fractured, frightened, and broken world. Today, it's an invisible enemy that adds to our world's brokenness and fears. This time next year, it will be something else, maybe worse. And later, it'll be something else. Survival will always include times of struggle. Such times call for people who know their Lord, who love Christ, and are able to model his strength and stability. I urge you to be that person for other people these days. It's been a great time to be with you. I look forward to seeing you next time.